He's been preaching a couple of days and the people aren't weary. I like my voice sounding like this. It sounds like I am large. <laughs> the people aren't weary. The words are right. For the first time in a long time, the words, they make sense. They make sense in their hearts and they make sense in their heads. And the preacher is preaching, just waxing lyrical, waxing beautiful. And he's coming down to his final thoughts. He surmises his whole discourse with the maxim, do to others as you would have them do to you. And it's clear now, from everyone's thought, that the kingdom is so much different than they expected. They knew that Messiah would be a great king and Messiah would rule righteously. They just didn't expect Messiah to be ru ruling from the throne of the heart. They expected him to be ruling from the throne in Herod's palace. But this man is different. This kingdom is different. His teaching is almost ended and he bids them enter this teaching through the narrow way, through the narrow gate. If you want to come into this kingdom, you have to enter through this narrow gate because there are parallel gates that are popular and everyone is traveling it right now. Everyone is traveling it. You see, he doesn't claim that his teachings is hard. He just says that there's no easy way into it. Luke 13 explains it. Go in your Bibles to Luke 13. Luke 13, 22 to 24 explains it because the whole issue comes up again. So let me read it for you. Let me read it for you. Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, will only a few people be saved? He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house has shut, has got up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will reply and say to you, I do not know you, and I, don't, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, oh, wait. We ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. But he will say, I do not know where you come from, all evildoers. And then they will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. When you say Abraham, when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom, and you yourselves thrown out, then people will come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Jesus is everywhere. Jesus is everywhere teaching his kingdom manifesto and making his way to his end because his end is Jerusalem and Jesus is making his way there. There's something beautiful about that. There's something beautiful about the fact that the gospel is taught on the way. There is something beautiful about the fact that Jesus doesn't sit and ponder his end. He moves towards his end, teaching and preaching as he goes. Maybe that is some of the frustration that we have as Christians, that we sit too much and ponder instead of moving as we go and teaching and preaching and allowing the kingdom to grow us. Maybe we spend just too much time pondering the kingdom instead of moving with the kingdom. Jesus is on his way to his end. And someone, no doubt, who has been traveling with him over the days, somebody, no doubt, who's been traveling with him over the days, has been listening to him, has been watching what he does, they turn and they say, say to him, Lord, so seriously, will only a few people be saved? In Jewish currency of the time, the question was more like, so what you're doing here in terms of the kingdom that you have, does this really make a difference? Or, said another way, so really, serious Jesus, who is being transformed by all this talk that you're doing about the kingdom? Or, among these people that you're teaching and healing, 
who really deserves to be saved? Or, I thought the kingdom was only for the Jews or the people who teach what we teach. I thought we were the ones who have the monopoly on the kingdom. Won't only, in fact, a few be saved? Jesus doesn't claim that he's teaching to be hard. He just simply says that there's no easy way into his teaching. And Jesus does as Jesus does. What's wrong with Jesus? Why can't Jesus ever answer a straight question? You ask Jesus a straight question and he just gives you a parable. I'm like, please, Jesus, just give me a straight answer. Jesus does as Jesus does and turns the attention from the collective outcome to the individual responsibility and says to that person, you strive to enter through the narrow gate. You strive to enter. You see, the, the struggle here as with all gates and ways that Jesus sets before us, is the striving to enter. That's where the struggle is. The struggle isn't with the gate and the struggle isn't with the way. The struggle is with the striving to enter. The idea behind the word strive comes from a Greek word called agonizo. And it simply, simply means, and it comes from the intentional, exerted effort put forth by any or just 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 showed by any athlete any athlete who was who who was competing in the greek games any of you who are athletes know that the idea or or any of you who are athletes know that an athlete doesn't struggle with the event a basketball player doesn't struggle with playing basketball a swimmer doesn't struggle with swimming. A runner doesn't struggle with running. An athlete doesn't struggle with the event. The fight for the athlete is with themselves to commit to the process the event requires. That is the struggle of waking at four instead of six, of eating this instead of that. Instead of, instead of running four miles, running eight miles. That is the struggle for the athlete. You see, J Jesus doesn't claim that his teaching is hard. He's just simply saying there's no easy way into it. And Jesus makes it clear. Jesus makes it clear from John 10 and John 14 that he is the gate and the way. Jesus is both door and gate and the way. So our true struggle really is with ourselves. That's where we struggle. Our true struggle is getting past ourselves so that we can get to Jesus. Our true struggle is getting past us so that we can do what the kingdom truly requires. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Yeah, I'm good with that, Jesus. And your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? No, no, no. The question is not, who is your neighbor? My pastor told me a few weeks ago, are you the neighbor? Not who is the neighbor. Are you the neighbor? <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Bless people who curse you. Love your enemies. This is our struggle because the kingdom is big, and it's bigger than what we are being thought of and what we are being talked about and what we are striving to actually do. The kingdom is large, and our striving is to get past us so that the grace given us, with the grace given us, we can truly make Jesus central. We can make Jesus all. You see, spiritual smugness and self-reliant assurance leads us to ask questions that are really just not our business to ask. And it causes us to question the hearts and the motives of others instead of questioning the hearts and the motives of our own selves. Amen. The idea that we have it all together and that the kingdom is ours and ours only leads us to make assumptions of God based on what we think 
instead of based on what the heart of God truly is. We don't strive with our own humanity. When we don't strive with our own humanity in the face of the king and his kingdom, four major things happen to us, individually and collectively. When we don't strive with the king and his kingdom in the face of him, four major things happen to us. Number one, we create our own gates and our own ways. Oh, we decide what the way into the kingdom is and the way that kingdom life is lived. Number two, if we don't do that, we minimize the centrality of the true gate and the true way and say things like, yeah, so you're going up to there to discuss what? Jesus and what else? Yeah, I know, but you're going to discuss the more important things than Jesus, aren't you? What, all you want to do is talk about Jesus? But when are you going to get to the meat? Yeah, I know, I know, but Jesus is the milk. You know, we come in at the milk, but when are you going to get to the meat? Man, Jesus is the three-course meal. Jesus is a, he's appetizer, first course, second course, third course, and dessert. When we don't face <laughs> the king and his kingdom, when we don't face our own humanity, when we don't strive with us, the reality of us to face the king and face his kingdom, we minimize the centrality of the true gate and the way. Number three, what we do is we adopt gate and way language but we build our own version of Jesus. So we'll talk Jesus, but we won't do Jesus. Well, not Jesus' version of Jesus, because our version of Jesus gets us through better. So we'll do the Jesus talk, but we'll wrap it in a theology that is all our own. Have you ever talked about somebody and they're in their presence? You know, they're there, and you're talking about them, but they're here. Have you ever had that? You ever had somebody talk about you? Like, you're standing there and two people are talking about you and you're like, hello? <laughs> hello, I'm here. I am here. <laughs> we create our own language. We, we adopt that language, but we, we, we maintain it with our own version of Jesus. And number four, we create gates in front of the way. So if you want to get to him, you have to go through this gate to get to him. You have to do this to get to him. Or we create ways behind the gate. Like when you enter in, yeah, yeah, yeah I know, I know, I know, I know. You could, you could have got in that way, but if you want to stay here, this is how you have to stay. The One Project isn't arrogant enough to believe that we monopolize, monopolize the, um, the discussion on Jesus because Jesus is a living person. And a living person can always rebut you. I think we're just wise enough to know that Jesus is going to be discussed the way he wants to be discussed. And if this is the way he wants to be discussed, he's going to be discussed this way. And when he chooses not to be discussed this way, he will be discussed in the way he wants to be discussed. There is something so beautiful and something so tragic about what is happening here, which is found in a, something that happened with me and my mum. My mum, she was, I don't know, she was on the, I don't know which police station she was coming from or probation officer. She was coming from somewhere with me and it was drama in Eddie's life, and I was sitting next to her on the bus, and I remember turning and looking at her, and she was just, oh, she was drained. And I turned and I looked at her and I said, Mom, don't you love me? Don't you love me anymore? She said, boy, of course I love you. I just can't trust you anymore. And we need to understand, Lord, will only a few people be saved? We are asking questions that God can't trust us with. 
You have to be God to answer that question. Why? Because God doesn't judge anybody by their behavior. You know that, I know that, the Bible teaches that. He judges from the heart. Number two, we do not know the journeys that people are taking with God through life independent of our view of them. We don't know what it took for this person to come from here to here. And Jesus makes it clear that those who are saved and are lost is way above our grace grade to decide or ask questions about way above our grace grade. We may get to describe what a saved person looks like, but we don't get to choose for Jesus who are his and who are not his. We may get to describe and define what the remnant looks like, but we don't get to decide who the remnant is. Only Jesus knows that. Read Revelation, he's calling them from Babylon and everywhere. So, hey, you strive to enter through the narrow gate. Don't worry about the people around you. You strive to enter through. This is neither the gate nor the way that he has chosen for us as a church or as individuals. You see, he never claimed his teaching to be hard. He just simply said, there's no easy way into it. Why? Because the way that blocks it is us. Us. We block it. We block it. So why strive? Why agonize? Because in there lays the glory of the kingdom. In there lays the glory of the kingdom. Here we are outside and he draws us into this kingdom. And in this kingdom, he grows us. In this kingdom, he changes us. He changes our ethic. He changes the way we view people. He changes the way we talk about people. He changes the way we see people in other denominations. He changes the way we see people who are just cast aside in our own denomination. He changes the way we see people of different ethnicities and sexualities. He changes everything. If we will strive, if we will strive and enter at him and walk in him. Matthew 7 and Matthew 13 show three central things about the kingdom that predominate and I don't want you to lose this, my family. Number one, the kingdom is life in Jesus. Number two, the kingdom is ruled by Jesus. Number three, the citizens of the kingdom are defined and decided by Jesus. And so, will only a few people be saved? I don't even want to know the answer to that question because I might be the few that Jesus describes who are standing outside the door saying, didn't I do this in your name? Instead, I'm going to spend this day and tomorrow trying to get past me so I can get to him. I'm going to strive to enter at him. I want you to strive with me. And so, Father, bless us. Oh, Jesus, please, help us to get out of your way. Help us to get out of our own way and simply enter and trust you. Amen. I'm sure there are lively discussions that are going on at your tables, and we're so glad that you are enjoying uh, those discussions. Anybody having a great discussion so far? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, listen, we want to take an opportunity and go into a little Q&A with our speaker. Uh, this will happen after each presentation, after each recalibrate session. We're going to spend about five minutes just asking some questions, going a little bit deeper, challenging our speakers, uh, making them sweat a little bit. <laughs> 
um, and so, so that we can further flesh out some of the ideas that may have resonated with us. So there's a text message number, SMS number, that's up on the screen. You can use that number to send in questions, and we will ask uh, as many as we can. We only have about five minutes, so uh, take that opportunity. I won't make that announcement again, so please use the SMS number uh, to send in any questions that you might have or might have, that might have come up, come up at your table. So Eddie, thanks again for sharing with us. Hey. Gates and ways. <laughs> Cool. So here's a question that came in from our viewing audience. Is there a way to best encourage a friend who is losing their way to strive with us without being overbearing? Um, I, I, I tell my congregation all the time, um, I tell practically everybody all the time, what Jesus is asking us to share with people is our lives, our, our personal lives. And I think the best way, you know, if you can't get people to a church, that's okay. It, it, it's really okay. If you can get them to you, then you've got them to church. You get them to the Christ that lives in you. And you do social things with them. And, and, and you do spiritual things with them outside of the physical context of the church. And that's how you can get them to continue to strive with you. If you allow them to be attached to your life, to your personal life. Because that's what Jesus did. All Jesus did was just attach these people to his personal life and journeyed with them. Gave them his power, authority, and, 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 and I feel that if we do that, then I feel that if you do that with your friend, then your friend is going to, yeah, they're going to hang around. They're going to stay around. Don't just preach to them, but walk with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, just live with them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. don't preach. Your life right. will say enough. Amen. Here's another question you talked about. Sometimes we put gates <laughs> in front of the way, <laughs> and we put ways behind the gates. <laughs> Um, what, what do you think are some of the obstacles that we may be creating in our life or in our church that, uh, that prevent us from accessing the way and going through the gate? I think in our personal life, we, one of the gates that we put in front of the way um, is we put our personal failures. Mm. We put our past personal fear of failing, mm. our past personal fear of letting God down. We struggle too much with the idea of sinning and letting him down. Mm. Um, so we just don't go in. And then behind... Behind him, I think we place, you know, our, our own personal choices. Um, I think that when God speaks to us, he speaks directly about how he wants us to be in a given situation or with a given person, and we fight that. God will tell you, you've wronged somebody, go and say sorry to them. Or God will say, that person has wronged you, but they don't know how to apologize, so you go and apologize to them so that you can be the bridge so that they can come back to you and come back to me. And we fight with that. You're like, oh. And then I think as, a, as, a, as, as collectively, we put our culturalism behind it, we put our history behind it, we put the fact that we've been in this church before the church was actually a church that was churched in the church that the church grew up in, you know? <laughs> You know, we put all of this stuff behind the gate and say that if you're going to make it to the kingdom, this is the way you have to do it. This is the way we, we do it. You know, and, and, and I think those are the gates we put in, in the ways in, we put in front of Jesus and the, and the ways we put behind him. You know? Can we say thank you to Eddie Hippolyte? Come on and put your hands together. The only thing we're upset about is that Australia stole him. That's the only thing we're upset about. <laughs> Pastor Hippolyte, we want to thank you for joining us, man. We appreciate your time. Listen, we're about to let you go for a refreshment break, but just before we do, there's a couple things we want to uh, draw to your attention. Uh, there is a photo booth in the Cummings room, a photo booth. Uh, you can record a 20-second video, and we would love for you to do that. Just some of your reflections, your thoughts, your uh, maybe a, a, a funny comment or a joke or experience that you've had here. We'd love for you to do that in the, in the, in the uh, Cummings room there at the photo booth. And you can also take pictures for a special gold coin donation. <laughs> All right. Guys, will pick that up. Um, so, yeah, that's right in the Cummings room. 
I'm, I'm learning a little bit of Australian here, okay? Uh, that's in the Cummings Room, you can do that. Also, we wanna draw your attention to the fact that we are tweeting, we are on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and so we'd like you to use the hashtag, the number one project, the number one project, or the hashtag Jesus All. And when you do that, that will give us the ability to find all of the comments, the pictures, the videos that you might be posting, and we'll collect, uh, collate them all so that we can kind of have a collection of the gathering and the journey that we've been on together. Does that sound all right? Cool, one last thing about parking. How many parked at a metered spot today? Okay, that after 12, it's free. Praise the Lord, can we say praise the Lord, amen? Cool. Tomorrow, it's free all day. So, so you're good to go as long as you have paid up till 12. God bless those who haven't. You may wanna run out and take care of that. Um, uh, and then all the rest of the day and all day Sunday, you're good to go. So we're really glad that you guys are having a great time. We're about to take a refreshment break. Uh, we will be back here.